Okay, so thanks for joining us today for our second um, Newcastle Youth Studies Centre event. And um, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge um, we are meeting on the lands of the Wabakal and Moramai peoples on this campus at the University of Newcastle. We pay respect to elders past and present. And we'd also like to acknowledge and pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, First Nations peoples joining us here in the room or on Zoom today. Um, in terms of today's event, we are lucky enough to be joined by Professor Roger Burrows, who is currently Professor of Global Inequalities at the University of Bristol. Um, Roger is also a member of our, international member of our centre and is working with us on a couple of projects and some planning around um, working on FinTech. Um, and I see really that uh, the, the discussion we had last night about FinTech futures, I think actually there's a lot of overlap with what we're gonna look at today, particularly around the mining of data and the use and political use and you know what may we may call kind of some of the eugenics involved in what's going on. So, um, we're just going to talk for about fifty minutes or so, and then we'll um have a chat. About what you have to say afterwards. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, I don't need that. Ah, yeah, I've got a, 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 a thing. Can you hear me? Okay. If I if I talk, it means I can walk around um as well. Okay. So the talk today is a it's an odd one. Uh, and it can be quite triggering uh, for some people, uh, given uh, the sorts of issues that I'm going to going to talk about. So uh, just to, to warn you, that that might be the case. And my title is called The Super Rich, Digital Technologies and the Politics of Exit. And this kind of mosaic of images, uh, which are really kind of uh, odd images. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk to uh, throughout the kind of narrative reconstruction of a whole series of issues and events, some of which you might be familiar with, but perhaps which you haven't put together within a particular kind of coherent um, uh, assemblage. So uh, the subtitle of my talk is called The Sovereign Individual Reloaded. And it refers to, I think someone might be online without being muted, um, if that's okay. Is that all right? It might be someone called Curtis Yarvin. Uh, you never know. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. Um, and it refers to a book that was published in 1997 called The Sovereign Individual um, by James Dale Davidson, who no one will have ever heard of, but also someone called Lord William Rees Mogg, who was the editor of the Times newspaper and the father of a, uh, a prominent UK Brexiteer, uh, uh, an MP. Uh, and it will become apparent why that book um, is uh, particularly important for what I'm going to say, because although it was published in 1997, in the week that Tony Blair came to power, it prefigures much of what's happened since 1997 uh, in, in a way that is closer to science fiction than it is to uh, political philosophy. Uh, but I'm going to uh, begin, I hope. It's not clicking across, there it is. Um, by kind of advertising, I suppose, a series of novels and a series of recent books, uh, which cover some of the material I'm going to talk about today. Um, if you don't want to wade through a book like Crack Up Capitalism by Quinn Slobodian, and you fancy a good novel, uh, and if you enjoyed uh, her, her earlier novel, The Luminaries, I'd highly recommend the New Zealand author Eleanor Catton's new book, Burnham Wood, uh, which deals with some of the issues I'm going to talk about today tangentially. Indeed, uh, one of the key figures I'm going to talk about today is given a very strong fictional representation in that book. The second novel uh, I would suggest you had a look at was a novel called Red Pill by a character we're going to meet later on, uh, Harry Kunzru, um, a, a UK uh, novelist. Uh, and other than Crack Up Capitalism, I'd also uh, advise you to have a look at a, a new book called Adventure Capitalism by an American historian called uh, Raymond Crabe. So if any of the issues I talk about today uh, whet your appetite to, to delve a little bit more into these topics, uh, both in novelistic form and in analytic form, they would be the books that I would go to. All of them deal with what the future is likely to look at look like in the hands of billionaire tech anarcho-capitalists. So that's the first trigger. Uh, let me begin by way of context. And this, you know, I guess will be uh, familiar to you in terms of what's happened kind of globally since 2008 and what's accelerated since 2016 in terms of the global distribution of income uh, and wealth. Uh, so by way of context, um, 
essentially uh, what I want to suggest is that rather than thinking about what's happened to the global economy uh, since 2008 as a kind of a global recession, it's probably better to think of it as a global robbery uh, as uh, income and wealth has been redistributed uh, uh, up the class structure. And there's some uh, great work by uh, someone called Thomas Piketty, uh, a French political economist, uh, and his colleagues, which has used essentially big data, essentially, to look historically at what's happened to uh, relative rates of return on um, uh, investment uh, and also on, on income. I'm just going to show you a few graphs just to provide the context for what I want to talk about today in terms of really to try and understand the ideology, the belief systems of some of the, the wealthiest people um, on the planet. Not all of them, but a significant proportion um, of them, I'm going to suggest. And this first graph is sometimes called the elephant chart because some people believe it looks like an elephant with its trunk going up into the air. And essentially what it shows is the global change in the increase in income after it's been deflated for everybody uh, in the world. So essentially it shows how incomes have increased uh, over 35 years between 1980, 36 years actually, between 1980 and 2016. So you'll see it's generally a positive story. Incomes, uh, real incomes have increased for, 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 for everyone. And indeed for the bottom 50% of people on the planet, uh, they've increased uh, uh, significantly. Uh, they've, they've more or less doubled. However, uh, they haven't increased so significantly for, for what's sometimes called the squeezed bottom 90%, uh, mostly people in the US, Western Europe, and I guess Oceania um, as well. Incomes have increased, but they haven't increased at the same rate as those at the bottom of the income distribution, except for the top 1%, and especially for the top 0.1%, and especially for the top 0.001%. Uh, that's the elephant's trunk. So you can see uh, income uh, uh, increases haven't been uh, equally distributed. Uh, they've been massively um, uh, uh, in favour of those at the very top of the income structure. And what Piketty argues in his book Capital is that there's a very good reason for why this is happening. And what they do is they chart from uh, antiquity up until uh, what they project uh, is around uh, 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 the 21st century, the relative rates of return on income and wages as compared to rates of return on investments. And what they show is that the social sciences were actually a product of what they think now is an historical blip. The period after the First World War until about 1980 where, because of a set of contingent circumstances, wars, technology, trade unionism, and so on, there was a period of 80 or 90 years where rates of return on wages and salaries were higher than rates of return on capital. But that shifted uh, probably under the advent of what we've come to call neoliberalism from about 1980 onwards and has accelerated. And we're back now to a situation before the First World War where rates of return on capital are much greater than rates of return on wages and salaries. And if that doesn't change, the processes that I'm going to uh, uh, describe now will continue apace. We're going to see a greater and greater concentration of, of, of wealth in a smaller and smaller uh, group of, of, of people. And we're very fortunate um, that the uh, uh, charity Oxfam each year does a, a neat little calculation. It's often covered in some newspapers, not all newspapers, uh, they try and calculate how many plutocrats it would take across the globe to possess the same amount of wealth as is possessed by the bottom 50% of people on the planet. So you take the bottom 50% of the population, you add up their, their total wealth, and you see how many billionaires it would take to have the same amount of wealth as the bottom 50% of people on the planet. And in 2010, when they first did this exercise, they found there were 388 plutocrats. Then it went down to 177, 159, 92, 80. In 2015, uh, a, a busload, 62 individuals possessed as much wealth as the bottom 50% of people on the planet. Then it went to 42, and it's now 26. Some estimates have actually put it as low as eight individuals possessing as much wealth as the bottom 3.8 billion people on the planet. And this is the context that I want to set when I'm going to talk about 
uh, today within. We have on a global scale, a number of identifiable individuals who possess sometimes as much wealth as a small nation state. And uh, that has consequences. The journalist uh, and environmental critic, not liked by everybody, but, but, but uh, he, he has some interesting things to say. Uh, George Monbiot uh, wrote about this at the very point when uh, Boris Johnson uh, became uh, the prime minister in the UK. And I think it's worth just uh, looking at his hypothesis. It's a piece in The Guardian called Bring on the Killer Clowns. The ultra rich, he says, are benefiting from disaster capitalism as institutions, rules and democratic oversight implode. Everywhere, what he calls the killer clowns are taken over. Johnson, Nigel Farage, Trump, Modi, Bolsonaro, someone called Scott Morrison, Salvini, Erdogan, Orban, and a host of other what he calls ludicrous strongmen dominate nations that would have once have laughed them off stage. His theory is this. They seek the deconstruction of what he calls the administrative state. Chaos is the profit multiplier for the disaster capitalism on which the new billionaires thrive. Every rupture is used to seize more assets. As institutions, rules and democratic oversight implode, the oligarchs extend their wealth and power at our expense. At the same time, the killer clowns offer the oligarchs something else too, distraction and deflection. While they fleece us, we are urged to look elsewhere. We are mesmerized by buffoons who encourage us to channel the anger that should be preserved for billionaires towards imaginary enemies and customary scapegoats. Now, what I want to do in the rest of the paper is to actually look at some of the kind of belief systems, some of the theories, some of the ideologies that inform the actions of some of those billionaires. Mostly it should be said tech billionaires. And it's an ideology which I'm going to suggest uh, manifests itself variably across culture and politics and the economy. And I want to try and think about what it actually represents as uh, what essentially is the most kind of coherent vision of what we've uh, come to call the alt-right. The alt-right is a weird melange of, 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 of libertarian, paleo-conservative, uh, right-wing, reactionary, misogynist, racist discourses. And there isn't really a kind of a, a coherent philosophy that holds it all together. But if there was one, um, I'm going to suggest it would be this. It would be a position uh, that's come to be known as neo-reaction, sometimes called NRX. And as we'll see, sometimes called uh, more popularly, uh, popularly uh, the Dark Enlightenment. And in order to kind of uh, 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 codify what NRX is all about, I'm going to focus on the activities of four people, four males. I'm going to talk in particular about the most infamous of these people, um, someone called Peter Thiel, um, who you might uh, have heard of. Um, not only does he uh, have New Zealand citizenship uh, now, uh, uh, he is famous because he was one of the founders, along with Elon Musk, of PayPal, and he was until recently on the board of Facebook. Uh, and he owns uh, a number of companies, including one I'm going to return to later on, a company called Palantir, which is a data analytic company. He's a billionaire and he is, I would say, the funder of many of the activities, the philosophies, the prototyping uh, that constitutes neo-reaction. Neo the second person we're going to talk to is someone who's received substantial funding from Peter Thiel uh, and who um, wrote an incredibly influential, uh, very discursive, very long series of blog posts in the early uh, part of the 21st century uh, under the name of Mencius Molbug, real name Curtis Yarvin, who um, is, if you like, uh, the main uh, codifier, the main theorist of neo-reaction. Uh, and he's also a computer programmer and a very poor poet. Um, the third person who is going to be part of this story is a, a Google engineer called Patre Friedman. And that name Friedman might ring some bells because he's part of the Friedman dynasty. His grandfather and grandmother was Milton and Rose Friedman, famous for the promulgation of neoliberal ideas and monetarism. 
and his father uh, was David Friedman, uh, the libertarian legal scholar. Uh, Patre Friedman um, writes a little, but he's also an inventor, someone who uh, is interested in prototype and neo-reactionary ideas uh, as a material instantiation. And he's also received funding from Peter Thiel to establish something called the Seasteading Institute. Uh, and I'll return to why that's an important entity uh, as we progress. But for me, uh, the person I am most interested in, uh, perhaps, is a UK philosopher, used to be a UK philosopher, uh, quite a famous person in the early days of cybernetic cultural studies at the uh, University of Warwick, someone called Nick Land. And I'm not sure that Nick Land has ever met any of the other three, but he has been uh, an incredibly influential uh, codifier and theoretician, taking the ideas of these three people uh, and producing a, uh, a discourse, uh, mostly online, uh, call the dark enlightenment that kind of codifies neo-reactionary neo-reactionary thought and why land is so important is he was very very influential in the early days of cultural studies internet studies uh, and indeed was for a long while seen as a a, a largely progressive uh, political uh, uh, entity uh, he is now uh, sometimes you haven't have to be a judge on this uh, characterized as, as a fascist so uh, he's an interesting character not least because he draws upon uh, many of the same uh, social theorists uh, that we draw upon in our work within the social sciences, uh, Leotard, Deleuze and Guattari in particular, but puts them to uh, a, a more kind of based uh, work uh, in relation to uh, the political conclusions that he, he comes to. Um, if you were gonna map neo-reaction on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a hideous grid of uh, alt-right ideas, um, uh, and, and Bechtka, in a very nice paper, the aesthetics of the alt right uh, uh, positions them uh, as shown on that on that on that diagram. What does neo reaction argue? Well, uh, if I was going to construct an ideal type, I would say there are there are three things that it's opposed to, and there are three things that it's in in favour of. And I'll, I'll I'll kind of elaborate on each of these ideas as we as we progress. The first thing it's against. And the thing which outrages most progressives is that it is an anti-democratic movement. And we'll examine why they believe that democracy is doomed and why democracy can, can't keep up uh, with the speed of the new uh, technologies. Uh, their solution is what they call rage, retire all government employees and appoint a CEO or if you don't want a CEO, have a king or a queen. Run states, run countries, not as democracies, they say, run them as startups, run them as businesses. Democracy slows, slows things down. Appoint clever people to run political entities. The second thing that they're against is notions of ideologies of equality. They believe the work that we do, I'm a chair in uh, global inequalities, is essentially an ideological practice, that there is real human biodiversity and a position that's come to be known as hyper-racism uh, runs through their work. They believe uh, and promulgate a, a view of uh, human uh, difference uh, in terms of a biological grounding. It's almost like a return, as Steve indicated, to a kind of a an accelerated form of eugenics uh, and a form of scientific uh, racism. So an anti-democratic, essentially racist uh, ideology. And the third thing that they're against, and when I said before, you know, there are, there are bits of this world that you've already come across, but you might not have known where it came from, is they're against the cathedral. And for them, the cathedral is a kind of a crazily inverted Althusserian ideological state apparatus uh, which is you lot, which is uh, people who are promulgating ideas about equality, uh, uh, progressive politics, uh, uh, and the idea that we can somehow mitigate patterns of inequality and that we can do something about the inherent accelerationist uh, tendencies of capital. So elites, liberals, political correctness, academia, the media. They are interested in undermining 
you, us, the arts, the humanities, and all those kinds of activities which they see as a progressive fetter against the inherent accelerationist tendencies of capitalism. What are they in favor of? They're in favor essentially of three things. They're in favor of exit, but not voice, to use the famous uh, Hirschman distinction in the book, Exit, Voice and Loyalty. They don't believe democracy works. They're interested in trying to organize software, organizations, institutions, states, where exit is the only human right. You don't have a voice. If you don't like it, you can piss off. They're interested in trying to generate a market in governance. You don't make decisions through democratic processes. You try and develop a architecture, a virtual architecture or a physical architecture where you have a market for different forms of governance. And so they come up with all sorts of proposals about the formation of new patchwork state forms. They draw uh, on many occasions, and for reasons I'll, I'll come to discuss later on, on a range of social science, uh, sorry, uh, well, social science fiction texts. Uh, and here they draw upon Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash, if any of you have, have read Snow Crash, and the idea that we have a series of kind of competing suburbs or a patchwork of states all competing with each other for citizens. It reminds me a little bit of when you have modules and you have to compete for students on modules. The students have no say upon what they're taught, but they can exit from modules or make choices between different, different modules. So they're interested in the formation of architectures of exit. Um, and uh, they have what I'm going to call later on a whole series of uh, hyperstitions. And I'll explain what I mean by hyperstitions as we, as we progress. Things like seasteads, things like city-states, things like gated communities, notions of off-world life, think Elon Musk and SpaceX and Richard Branson and all the other indices uh, that, that now go into the idea about the colonization of Mars and so on. Exit, but no voice. Competing systems of governance will be the system of regulation, not internal democratic structures. The third, uh, sorry, the second thing uh, that they uh, are in favor of, or mm, not in favor of, they think of as ine inevitable, is what they call the singularity. AI has arrived, automation has arrived, the world of post-humanism is uh, upon us, uh, and it's only uh, people in universities and in progressive aspects of the cathedral uh, who don't realize the inevitability uh, of these kind of tendencies, uh, 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 in, uh, which, are, which are simply things that we can mitigate and, and stop for short periods of time uh, before uh, they, they come to overtake us. And they have models, they have models that they believe work. And this is uh, uh, the analysis that Quinn Slobodian offers in his Crack Up Capitalism book. Uh, they're interested in highly technological capitalistic states, which are anti-democratic, that are run like businesses. So the model for them was Hong Kong, maybe still is Hong Kong, but it's Singapore, and what they call Neo-China, uh, uh, economic enterprise zones, uh, across the world, which are technologically advanced, run by essentially a CEO, and there is no democratic uh, control within them. That's the model that they think uh, is most 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 effective. So let me go through this in a little bit more 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 detail, um, and let me uh, begin by looking at the the, the work of, of Yarvin and Land's interpretation of it. Both of those writers draw upon a key essay by Thiel from uh, from two thousand and nine, uh, published in. Uh, Cato Unbound, which is the house journal of the Cato Institute in Washington, a neoliberal libertarian uh, uh, think tank uh, uh, funded by uh, one of the um, uh, one of the brothers, in which he uh, famously declares, Teal this is, that, quote, I no longer believe that freedom and democracy are compatible. Nick Land, of course, well, I say of course, but if you're not familiar with his work, you won't know this, goes much further, suggesting that democracy is not merely doomed, it is doom itself. For him, democratic political forms involve cropping out all high frequency feedback mechanisms, such as essentially market signals, and replacing them with a sluggish infrared loops that pass through a centralized forum of general will. A radically democratized society insulates uh, parasitism from what it does, transforming local, painfully dysfunctional, intolerable, and thus urgently corrected behavior patterns into global, numb, 
and chronic socio-political pathologies. That's the function of democracy for land. If you just left it to the market, it would all kind of wash out in, in his, his worldview. The NRX, the neo-reaction alternative, is first to rage, to retire all government employees in order to reboot the economy, and second, to replace democratic institutions with a CEO or even a, a monarch. They're interested in the establishment of what they call GovCorps, commercial systems of governments, societies run as a business uh, that can be regulated, as I said, not by the voice of its members, not by the voice of its citizenry, uh, there will be no democracy, but via uh, citizens' ability to exit as consumers in a free market for governance. If you want to live in a communist society, you can build a communist society and it will compete with other forms of governance and they will be regulated by the movement of citizens who will make a choice in relation to where they want to uh, 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 reside or as we'll see later on, where they want to engage virtually. So a market in governance. Land in particular has become obsessed with the ideas contained in the classic uh, book by Albert Hirschman on the distinction between exit voice and loyalty. The land, democratic voice, and what he sees as the warm solidarities of loyalty need to be opposed as they will, uh, uh, as we saw before, cut out all high frequency feedback mechanisms. He's interested in cold, rational game theoretic decisions uh, about the organization of life. For Yarvin, any attempt to engage politically through voice is going to be ineffective, even futile. For him, there's a pervasive error that monopolizes civic and political discourse. He's interested in designing new architectures of exit, and that becomes of paramount importance. Indeed, for Land, quoting Patrick Friedman, free exit is so important that it is the only universal human right. It is the only universal human right. So they're interested in organizational and technological prototype and theoretical ideas that generate competing forms of governance within organizations uh, and within uh, across the globe through a patchwork um, of, uh, of ideas. Now, um, Elizabeth Sandifer in a, in, a, in a great book called Neo Reaction, a Basilisk, um, makes this point that approaching uh, neo-reactionary thinking just a few years ago might have been a mildly diverting exercise, a chance to connect some philosophical ideas using some very silly right-wing nut jobs who were nevertheless interesting. But post-2016, uh, and as Sandifer expresses it in their own uh, in, in, in style, everything went to shit. And suddenly these otherwise batshit crazy ideas associated with software projects and social prototyping experiments began to manifest across a whole range of global, cultural, political, and technological imaginaries. A bunch of nut jobs suddenly got huge amounts of funding from Teal and other libertarian investors to try out uh, some of these ideas. As hard as it is to fathom, neo-reactionary thinking now forms a significant part of the theoretical universe that contemporary political figures and what we might think of as proto-theorists, such as Dominic Cummings, who I'll talk about in a minute, in the UK, and Steve Bannon in the US, and you might well have some Australian examples as well, draw upon and are attempting to promulgate into mainstream political discourse. What about Australia? We can have a discussion about that. As Angela Nagel, in her analysis, uh, Kill All Normies uh, 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 explains it, supporters of neo-reactionary ideas seem to have been more adept at heeding the ideas of Gramsci's theory of hegemony, especially via social media, than have those on the left more usually associated with his ideas. And these people have read their Gramsci, they've read their Lenin, uh, they've read their Deleuze and Guattari, they've read their Leotard, they've probably even read their Bourdieu, and many of them uh, are educated both in software design and in uh, 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 liberal arts education um, as well. Here's Mulbug. Uh, Formless Manifesto, an open letter to uh, open-minded progressives, a gentle introduction to unqualified reservations, which are the early blogs um, which form the basis of the Dark Enlightenment as, as manifest within um, uh, uh, Nick Lang's uh, representation of it. Now, he begins with the old matrix uh, metaphor, the, the red pill uh, and the blue pill, and NRX thinking has come to be known as being red-pilled. 
and a number of, 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 of uh, uh, celebrities, um, uh, those who uh, uh, have chosen not to become a Scientologist, uh, um, for instance, are often declared that they have been red-pilled. Musk has said this on a number of occasions. It's an engineering, computational ideology. Um, uh, Yarvin Mulbug is a computer scientist. He's an engineer. and He applies the same sorts of principles to political ideas. He begins the blog. Uh, the other day, I was tinkering around in my garage, and I decided to build a new ideology. It's a mechanistic, computational ontology that, that, that tries to apply uh, the ideas of a kind of a formalism and a, and a, and a particular form of, of, of rationalism that tries to break through from the ideological uh, apparatus that he sees uh, 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 the cathedral represents. The basic idea is that, and this is Mulbug talking in 2008, as the crappy governments we inherited from history are smashed, they should be replaced by a global spider web of tens, even hundreds of thousands of sovereign and independent mini countries, each governed by its own joint stock corporation without regard to the residents' opinions. If residents don't like their government, they can and should move. The design is all about exit and no voice. That's what he's in favor of. And again, just to give a flavor of the, 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 the tone of the blog, he's against what he calls progressivism, which has become a veritable religion of quack government. Its policies are always counterintuitive. It preaches leniency as the cure for crime, timidity as military genius, profligacy as the acme of economics, special education as the heart of pedagogy, indulgence as oversight, appeasement as diplomacy. As it goes from one disaster to the next, progressivism never considers the possibility that the obvious rather than the opposite could be the case. You'll already hear resonances of this uh, within uh, not just alt-right discourse, but within uh, uh, especially uh, American GOP uh, discourse uh, and uh, Fox, Fox News uh, uh, promulgators of these sorts of views. But let me focus on land, because land for me is a very interesting character. This is a, a little video I'm going to play uh, to you from land in 1994, when he just turned up at the University of Warwick. And this is from an Adam Curtis documentary about Singapore in 1994. And what's interesting about land is that, that he was seen at the time to be someone who was offering a very, very kind of unique interpretation of the work of Deleuze, who was quite new to an English speaking audience at that time. And he was also uh, very much taken with the work of Manuel de Landa, uh, who again was uh, offering a particular interpretation of, of Deleuze. And he was obsessed with the early science fiction novels of William Gibson, Euromancer in particular. But what nobody noticed, or very few people noticed at the time, was as well as being interested in those three writers, he was also interested in Hayek, von Mises, and in cybernetics. And the balance of those interests have shifted over time towards von Mises and away from uh, Delanda. At the time, there was one writer, Benjamin Noyes, uh, who did uh, kind of get a sense of what land was about. And at the time, uh, uh, under Thatcher, he, he branded him a Thatcherite Deleuzian. But this is uh, Nick Land talking in 1994, uh, and it sounds perfectly reasonable. I can't hear it. Well, you clearly couldn't hear that, but essentially what he was saying is that organizations which have a top-down structure, a bureaucratic structure, are going to be replaced by organizational technological forms that are going to operate from the bottom up. Uh, and it's inevitable that it's happening across organizational life and across technology. And it's the beginning of essentially what we now might think of as a kind of a, 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 a Bitcoin orientation. It's, a, it's about the, the, the end of trusted third parties. It's a, a way from control systems. It's about, if you like, um, a, a technological system that, um, that, that, that offers peer-to-peer um, -peer interaction. I won't take you through the life story of Nick Land. It's something I'm interested in, but very, very few people are interested in, other than to say, that he was associated with some very, very influential people 
in social and political science who until recently some have held on to a belief that what he's doing at the moment is a piece of performance art rather than fascism uh, but some who have, have, have clearly um, uh, got a measure of what's going what's going on uh, one of the key early figures indeed his partner for a, for a period was Sadie Plant who some of you might have come across a very prominent a cyber cyber feminist um, in her book uh, Zero Zeros and Ones uh, and uh, an earlier study of the Situationists. Um, I guess I'm interested in Land because um, I was partly responsible for publishing some of his early essays in a, in a book I edited in the mid '90s with with Mike Featherston called Cyberspace, Cyber Bodies, and Cyberpunk. And in that volume, uh, both Nick Land and uh, Sadie Plant both published 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 papers. And so uh, it's been very interesting for me to see what happened. He disappeared. He got thrown out of the University of Warwick for, for general craziness and, and misuse of amphetamines. Um, he ended up in a body shop, uh, essentially, in the, 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 the centre of uh, Leamington Spa, uh, surrounded by a series of, of, of acolytes. Uh, and he got booted out, sacked from the University of Warwick and disappeared for a number of years. He turned up in China. He turned up in Shanghai with an ex-PhD student, Anna Greenspan, who's a very prominent urbanist. Um, and uh, he began, they began uh, by publishing essentially travelogues uh, and uh, guides to China. Um, and then he began to blog. And somehow, and I don't think anyone's very clear about how this happened, he came across the blogs of Curtis Yarbin, Molbug. And he was very taken with Molbug's blogs and he began to reinterpret Moldbug's blogs through the cipher of the Deleuzean Guattarian framework. And he took this discourse and produced a short booklet, a blog, I guess, called The Dark Enlightenment, which was a kind of a Deleuzean codification of uh, uh, Moldbug. And, and it became a, a, a kind of a, a tipping point, if you like, in terms of the, the codification of neo reactionary. Um, ideas. Now, some of the people who studied with Land uh, will be known to you, both as social theorists, as an artist, and as musicians. His, his influence has been, been, been great. I mean, obviously, Sadie Plant, Mark Fisher, who might be known to you. And I think, in a sense, Fisher's kind of popularity um, in the last few years before his death, in a sense, was what kind of ignited interest in Land again. And people suddenly discovered what Land had been up to. And, and there was quite an interesting um, quite sad debate between between Fisher uh, and Land. Uh, Matt Fuller uh, again studied uh, with Land at the CCRU. Uh, Kodwu Urshan, Luciana Parisi, Anna Greenspan, who's Land's partner. Uh, Robin McKay, uh, the publisher. Uh, the philosopher Roy Brazier, uh, another philosopher in uh, Hamilton Grant. An Iranian philosopher Reza Negastani, uh, but also uh, some people in the cultural sphere. Uh, the, the contemporary artist Jake and Dinos Chapman studied with them. Code Nine, Steve Goodman, some of you might be familiar with the work of Burial, the space ape, uh, did his PhD uh, on sonics with Land. Maggie Roberts, uh, the digital artist, the novelist who we've already seen, uh, 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 Harry uh, Kunzro, and the novelist Nick Blenko all studied with um, Land. I'm not saying any of them uh, believe what he believes and what he argues now, uh, but they were key figures. Uh, and, and acolytes for a time of early early Landian um, ideas. Uh, Land has also become a meme. I haven't got time to show you, but if you're interested in looking at the memetic expression of Land, um, uh, you, you can you can you can you can do that. Uh, he also became kind of a symbol for what was happening in terms of the the, the demise of the administrative state in the UK. Uh, Cummings, it turned out, had been blogging on various uh, uh, sites which was sympathetic to neo-reactionary and Landian ideas. And a, a, a pastiche uh, Twitter, when, as it was called then, uh, a, a group called X Rogue Whitehall Staff posted a picture of Nick Land's fanged nomina, uh, suggesting that it was weekend reading uh, for uh, bureaucrats uh, within, within the civil service. And uh, Cummings uh, then went on to appoint people who were explicitly advocates of neo-reactionary ideas into the very heart of government. Uh, and this one here, uh, Andrew Sabrisky, uh, who's a data analyst, and it's gonna be important, he is a data analyst, a Bayesian uh, statistician as well, um, was moved into the heart of uh, data and uh, the data analytic function in Downing Street uh, before he was revealed 
as a misogynist racist shit and uh, was removed uh, from uh, from that from that post but there was a point when neo reactionary ideas were in number 10 Downing Street uh, and it's crazy to believe that that happened and I hope it's not happening now uh, but it's certainly happening within uh, American context the, the 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 social and cultural theorist Paul Gilroy has written extensively about these uh, these issues and in a sense I think he provides a very neat summary uh, here. I won't read out the, uh, the, the full quote because I haven't got time, but, but there's plenty of places to go to look at kind of critical reflections on, on how this came upon us and what it was, because it doesn't fit with any of the, the traditional notions of, of social and political science, not least because it was created and existed outside of the cathedral. This was primarily, if you like, almost like an alternative social science, if you'd call it that, based upon a very... A different set of origins and, and, and precepts uh, than, than those that, that, that we're familiar with. So there's a little bit about Yarvin and a little bit uh, about land. Uh, and let's now look at Patre, uh, Patre Friedman. Uh, Patre Friedman, as I said, the, the grandson of, of, of Milton Friedman, uh, probably uh, uh, certainly not a neoliberal, I would say more of a kind of a narco libertarian, got a, a large sum of money from Peter Thiel to establish something called the Seasteading Institute. Now, you know, there's clearly uh, something here about rising sea levels and climate change and the idea that we should think about building prototypes of cities on the sea. The idea that we could build seasteads, floating cities, uh, which again comes from uh, Neil Stevenson's uh, Snow Crash. And this is a quote from uh, a book called Seasteading that uh, Patre Friedman wrote with Joe Quirk. And in a sense, it summarizes in, 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 a, in a language that is uh, quite neutral in this, in this sense, the basics of neo-reactionary ideas through uh, 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 imagining how the seasteading system might work. David Friedman, his father, described the machinery of freedom. Milton Friedman advocated the freedom to choose. Patre Friedman identified a machinery, an architecture, if you like, of freedom to choose. He proposed an idea that became contagious. Imagine 10,000 homesteads on the sea, seasteads, where ocean pioneers will be free to experiment with new societies. Aquatic citizens could live in modular pods that can detach at any time and sail to join another floating city, compelling ocean governments to compete for mobile citizens a market of competing governments would allow the best ideas for governance to emerge peacefully, unleashing unimaginable progress. By such means, an economic and moral argument could become a technological experiment. Architectures of exit, no voice, just exit, a system of governance imagined through uh, the seastead. And they employed architects to come up with these amazing drawings of what the seasteading world might look like. Here are some of the images of the future of the seastead. The reality, however, looked more like this. Um, uh, and at a conference hosted by Teal in 2009, uh, essentially seasteaders came together to talk about this wonderful future of this neo-reactionary future on, on the water. The tenor, uh, this is a quote from the paper by Steinberg, uh, Atlas Swam. The tenor ranged from that of a science fiction convention Potential seasteaders in attendance, who were overwhelmingly men, surprise, surprise, wondered what they could do to attract women to come and live with them on seasteads. Then there was a seminar in libertarian economics with references, of course, to Milton Friedman, to Hayek, to Menker Olson, to Ayn Rand. Then there was a scientific meeting on ocean engineering, architectural rendings, some of which you've seen, were displayed and critiqued. Then uh, there was a psychedelic enclave of free thinking anarchists. Indeed, the entire seasteading venture might easily be written off as an impractical fantasy of social misfits and political dreamers who would like to make their own states. And of course, it's a ridiculous idea. No one has built a seastead and no one is going to build a seastead that functions anytime soon. But I want to argue that's not the point. The point is that those dreaming these sorts of thoughts about creating their own states are now greater in number and have more political and institutional support for that aspiration. Enclave libertarian ideas, including the work of the Startup Cities Institute, 
are now supported by the late likes of the Cato Institute, by the Mises Institute, by the Foundation for Economic Education and the Montpellier Society, as well as Silicon Valley and other billionaires and political strategists who have been red-pilled. However, and this is, I suppose, the central point of what I want to, to say today, neo-reaction is all about dreaming of a certain kind. This process is central to the neo-reactionary hegemonic strategy. As Steinberg, in a paper I just quoted from, intuited, seasteads would not be established anytime soon, but their purpose was to reflect on the sensible limits of freedom imposed by the state so that others will dream up and implement more practical alternatives. This is a cultural and political strategy of what has come to be known as uh, hyperstition, an idea central to Nick Land's ideas, a notion that has long been central to Land from the very, very early days. For Land, time, like much else, is non-linear, and thus relations between cause and effect are always complex. Futurity is in the here and now in the sense that it's not something that just unfolds, it is something we create on occasions, pretended social imaginaries, designs, diagrams, fictions, maps, movies, plans, philosophies, prototypes, theories, dreams, and more become generative of the future. It is as if the tentacles of the future entities reach back through time in order to bring into being the very elements necessary for their own materialization. And for land, that is what AI is doing. That's what AI is doing. He believes that singularity, in the, you know, in a sense, is essential for these processes to occur, to build and to imagine these things now in order to actualize the future. So hyperstition then is about fictional entities, dreams that make themselves real. And NRX has been interested in trying to identify cultural artifacts that serve that function, fictional entities that make themselves real. In a great paper, Heider explains that there does not exist a simple word for this cause and effect relationship in ordinary English, but Land coined one, hyperstition, that which is equipoised between fiction and technology. Hyperstition, then, is a positive feedback circuit, including culture as a component. It can be defined as the experimental technoscience of self-fulfilling prophecies. Superstitions are merely false beliefs, but hyperstitions, uh, by their very existence as ideas, function causally to bring about their own reality. Capitalist economics is extremely sensitive to hyperstition where confidence acts as an effective tonic and inversely. The fictional idea of cyberspace, for instance, contributed to the influx of investment that rapidly converted into a techno-social reality. Neuromancer is the hyperstitional novel per excellence. But for the NRX, there are many others, here's some of them. The fictional social imaginaries offered up by movies such as Metropolis or Blade Runner and by novels like Rand's Atlas Shrugged or Gibson's Neuromancer or especially in the case of NRX, Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash are all examples of hyperstition. But so too are broader discursive assemblages that come to function as ideologies. And as I've already discussed, Friedman's seasteading adventures could be thought of it in this way. They're not practical, but it's a way of thinking about a fictional entity that you know, can we think of a way of, of, of developing the, the, these notions? However, it's really Yarvin that we need to go to if we're going to be interested in this hyperstitional politics. Um, because as well as writing a blog, he's a coder. He's an engineer and he's uh, received substantial sums of money by Teal and others to establish a company in order to produce a new piece of software called Urbit. Urbit is a completely impractical piece of software, but like seasteading, it serves the ideological hyperstitional function of providing a kind of a, a framework for thinking about a future virtual set of architectures. And there's a quote there uh, which refers to that, 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 that process, which again, I won't go into, into here now. But it's the idea that, that Urbit like seasteading, is a kind of a virtual software concomitant of those ideas. It provides a hyperstitional resource for thinking about the future of the web, for thinking about a world in which, rather than thinking about a patchwork of territory as land, not Nick land, physical land as space, increasingly we come to think of territory as also being virtual. And there, a lack of democracy and the, the function of exit is already very apparent. 
We know about the bubbles on Facebook. We know about the bubbles within social media. We know about the self-selection and the exit strategies when people don't like a series of discussions. And Urbe is designed to facilitate uh, those sorts of processes. Now, I haven't, there's a little bit of an excursus here that I'm not going to go through because I don't think I've got time to do it. But land is also associated with a set of other uh, 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 ideas associated uh, with his thinking, which uh, isn't the same as NRX, but which has been very influential. That's the idea of accelerationism. Land is often seen as the, 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 the grandfather of accelerationism. And if anyone is interested, um, uh, there's some, some details there about accelerationist ideas. Uh, it's, about, it's about the application of Deleuze and Guattarian ideas to the analysis of capitalism. But just what I want to, want to get out of it, and I'm not going to read the quotes, is that the inherent nihilism of the position. And it's the idea that, that, that NRX ideas and accelerationism are inherently anti-humanist. They're interested in the process of value creation under capitalism, which for a period of time required human beings to be the bearer of that process. With AI, with machinic culture, the process is all. And for these writers, there's no you can do about it. You can set up a few kind of blue pill progressive institutions to try and stop it uh, and to, to moderate it. You can set up welfare systems, but the process is all. The process is inevitable. And the process is shifted away from human entrepreneurship and human endeavor into machines, into algorithms, into uh, 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 something that is becoming inevitable. So it's another way of thinking about these issues, and it, it relates to their ideas about the singularity and the role of AI in particular. Um, coming to a, a close now in the next five, 10 minutes, um, I want to draw, sort of draw this kind of comparison between Urbit and seasteading as the same thing, essentially, as imaginal resources for thinking about a future for the architecture of exit. Urbit is a virtual city in the cloud, whereas seasteading is a, a material city on the sea, but none of them allow for democratic control. All of them are premised upon an architecture of exit, of the ability of individuals to move. Uh, and it's through that kind of market for governance that these systems are regulated. It's a path to digital freedom. Urbit, all of the code written by Yarvin at the same time as he was writing the blog, the two things are clearly linked. Um, uh, uh, in, in Urbit, network identities a crypto cryptographic property like Bitcoin. If Bitcoin is money and Ethereum is law, Urbit is land in this uh, uh, blockchain cryptocurrency uh, world. It's a sovereignty for the 21st century inspired by the sovereign individual from 1997, another hyperstitional text, uh, uh, which when people read it and very few people in the social sciences read it uh, in 1997, Although there is a page that I think we should all read when Rees Mogg says, it's really interesting what's happening in the arts and humanities and the social sciences. They're all getting into this sort of relativism, this kind of, you know, political notion of postmodernism. And we should encourage it because it breaks down patterns of solidarity. It's all about relativisms. It's all about kind of an intersectional politics that is going to be very, very good for us. So, you know, find out about postmodernism because uh, it's something that we should encourage and cultivate within the academy. Anyway, neither here nor there. It's the idea that, that sovereignty of the 21st century is going to be based of, not upon kind of membership of a state form, not based upon a territory, but about the ability uh, to have a, 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 a software and perhaps a physical territory which allows exit to regulate systems of governance. Um, it will lead in their uh, worldview, the competition between different political systems. Uh, and again, uh, if any of you are interested, there's some detail about um, uh, the notion of, 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 of Urbit. But the best way to think about it is to think it as the virtual concomitant of seasteading, the idea that these detachable modules can move around to different parts and parcels of, 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 of the space. And it's through that system of regulation of competition for different ways of living uh, rather than democratic governance. Uh, through which um, uh, social systems uh, will will develop. Will develop. So that's why I've, I've subtitled the talk uh, The Sovereign uh, Individual uh, Reloaded, uh, a techno-utopian right libertarianism, Urbit 
as uh, the vivid imaginaries of, of, of such a post neoliberal future where exit is your only uh, political uh, right. Okay, coming to an end, um, it's not to everybody's taste, but I thought the, the Quinn Slobodian book was a, was a very good historical analysis of zones and of the emergence of neo reactionary ideas. I think there is something interesting in the notion of hyperstition. And I think it's worth going back to read The Sovereign Individual from 1997, just to look at, not as a, a kind of a blueprint for what was to come, but as a kind of a guide for uh, uh, investors in terms of what, what, uh, what they call the information society was gonna become, uh, especially in relation to the emergence of the blockchain and cryptocurrency, 1997. It, it, it's a, 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 a hyperstitional text that no one in the social sciences uh, read. But these people, these billionaire libertarians interested in these ideas, but also interested in the establishment of software that we all use, is something we need to be alert to. And this again comes from a recent Adam Curtis uh, documentary, and it's, a, it's an image that also comes from the Hader uh, uh, paper, The Darkness at the End of the Tunnel, Artificial Intelligence Near Reaction. And it's to do with the way in which software can never be neutral. It always involves the instantiation of ideological ideas within the code. And increasingly now within AI and within machine learning technologies, we don't even know what that is other than the people who have funded it have near reactionary predilection. Now we might assume that there's no relationship between people's ideological position and the code that they write, but I don't think that's the case. And this seems to me to be a very nice way of illustrating it. Uh, on the left-hand side is an image of the inside of Siena Cathedral, if any of you have ever been there. And on the right-hand side, there's another image of Siena Cathedral as seen by a machine learning algorithm that was trained to recognize dogs and it sees dogs in Siena Cathedral. Now we might not see dogs but to the extent that the code that we use is funded by and produced by people who have a predilection towards Moldbug and neo-reactionary ideas and the idea that we are moving away from democracy towards uh, new systems of patchwork cultures, um, I think the message is quite clear. The money came from PayPal, the money came from Facebook. We need to be alert to what Musk is doing with X, with Twitter. And we need to understand and map out the ownership patterns of software in particular that we all use in every day in our universities, which is funded by, owned by, and written by people who are essentially neo-reactions, neo-reactionaries. And just to end with, you know, these might sound, as Sandifer says, like nut jobs, but they're nut jobs who have an, an increasing influence upon political culture and upon software. Tucker Carlson, no longer at Fox, but when he was at Fox, interviewed Mulbug, Yarvin, at peak time for 90 minutes on mainstream American television. Clearview, the software company, which is about facial recognition technologies, is owned by Huan Ton Fat, who's a signed up member of NRX Belief Systems. Um, the current presidential candidate for the Argentinian presidential election espouses neo-reactionary ideas. There's Peter Thiel, with Trump, who of course they all adore, not because he's a neo-reactionary, he's not read any Curtis Yarvin, I dare say, but because he's a businessman. He represents the CEO model, and he is also a, a person who is doing immense damage to the legitimacy of democracy. So they like him for those reasons. And the other images which concern me, because I spend uh, some of the year in the UK, is the UK NHS, has just contracted multi-billion pound contracts to Palantir, owned by Teal, to analyze bio data, to analyze data within the health service. It's frightening in its consequences. And neo-reactionary ideas is now finding its way into the GOP. Uh, J.D. Vance in Ohio, 
is a, a near reactionary. Count Curtis Yarvin is one of his best friends. So these are idiotic ideas, which nevertheless have been funded by libertarian tech uh, billionaires and are finding their way into uh, the political mainstream. If you want to read about it in more detail, uh, there's a paper in uh, a special issue of um, TCS, Theory, Culture and Society, on post-neoliberalism that I wrote with a uh, colleague, Harrison Smith, called Software, Sovereignty and the Post-Neoliberal uh, Politics uh, of Exit. But there, uh, I'll leave it and we can have some questions. Thanks. Okay, thanks for that great talk, that scary great talk. Um, so we have some people online and people in the room. Um, the questions may or may not come in. Has anyone in the room got a question for Robert? Yeah. Thank you, Roger. That was really fascinating. Um, I this possibly a really, really naive question, but I'm like really mystified by what isn't in any of that. Like there's absolutely no mention, even when we're thinking about cities on the sea of climate change. Mm -hmm. Like I'd I'd be really interested to see if there's any kind of consideration of how we're having hundreds of thousands of little kind of micro states, how could you possibly tackle global issues? Is there any kind of consideration of that? Is, and clearly there's yeah anyway and i'm also interested in is there any consideration around what social security would look like because my mind immediately goes to those kind of beautiful seafaring cities i think the reality if they were possible at some point in the future would just be massive slums around them with mm -hmm. people that are a little bit so yeah uh, well, uh, that, that, they're very good questions, but the trouble is, in, in the Landian uh, world, the trouble is you're thinking about people, and you're caring about people, and you're thinking about um, a, a, a world in the Landian universe that is entirely nihilistic. So, climate change is probably inevitable in this worldview. Seasteading might help a little bit, but that's why we're building rockets, and we're not building rockets for you and me were building rockets for a new elite of a, of a, a cognitive elite in, in their worldview. Um, uh, uh, so um, I don't think it's a consideration. I mean, for them, uh, uh, welfare systems are, are blue pilling. They're, 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 they're forms of progressivism that simply uh, uh, mitigate against unmitigated, uh, uh, un what they would call uncompensated capitalism. So it's a worldview that comes out of the cathedral. In a sense, why are you even thinking about these things? The process is inevitable. You can hold it back for a little while, but what will be will be, and it will be through through uh, 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 an anarchistic marketization. That the, the, not a solution, but there will be some outcome through through, through through those issues. So I think that we're in a world where these people think that there's a certain inevitability about uh, climate change, and that we need to engage in the recolonization of space. I know it sounds bonkers, but you think about it. I mean, it's, 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 you know, don't look up. But think about the billions that Bezos, Branson, Branson, it's Branson, and uh, 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 SpaceX, putting in space exploration. That's, that's a concern. And the concern isn't for the people. Yeah. The concern is for the public to me, um, who, who, who are going to, uh, um, but there's not, a, it, it, the cognitive elite increasingly becomes the singularity it begins to merge with AI, and again, there's a certain inevitability about that. So it's already been so nice to so no time about it, but that would be, I think, uh, what 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 would get the Yeah, I believe in singularity that might belong to Santa or people which might be down over the brain. So we forever. But the other thing I increasingly believe in is affecting the altruism, where it's like you need to care about future people that you know truly is sort of. Things to bring or whatever. So the death of a few million people now, as long as you set up systems in the future, you don't last for them to live, is utilitarian because those future people still exist. And the death of destruction now doesn't matter. So. 
and the other question is on the um that, that, that's that's an option. No, no, I know, 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 massively funded. I know, I know, I know. Sets up at Oxford University. I know, I know. Um, so we have a little question here online. Um, how can those of us boarding of the institutions that have been termed the cathedral or the community strike, perhaps in the city that we talk, most effectively deal with NRX resources? Which have been alarmingly popular and successful without doubling down on enabling their strategies, which frequently rely on hero given narratives. True. It's a great question. Great question. Um, well, I think we can educate ourselves about near reaction, first of all, because it's something that exists outside of the cathedral experience. It's not written about in academic texts until recently. It's an online thing. And I've been quite struck when I've given talks about this, just how academic. Never heard of it and not interested in it and don't think it's of any interest. And yet my students in architecture and planning, in computing, have read Mobile and was read about Peter Thiel. So something's happened. And it's it's it is an old social science that has that has come out of the account. So first we need to educate ourselves about it. Second, I think we can um go back and, and think about what kind of a digital Gramscian hegemonic strategy looks like because Essentially, the old right and near reaction in particular has done really well at kind of an ironizing mimetic politics that the, the, the left has kind of lost, you know, in some way. So I think that's a, that's, that's a kind of a, a, a strategism. Um, I think we need to analyze it. I think we need to kind of to, 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 to allow our frameworks to, to bear on uh, the, 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 the topic. And I think probably we need a little bit of history. We need to look at the origins of these ideas. We need to go back to von Mises. We need to go back to Hayek. We go, need to go back. And Melinda Cooper's recent work, for instance, looking at the entwining of neoliberal ideas with um, paleo conservatism. I think I would say in Australia and certainly in Europe, in contradiction to America, we've had to deal with neoliberalism. But we've never had to deal with fundamental libertarian ideas and impactful input. And these are, this, is, this is why I think it's a post neoliberalism. I mean, there's elements of an overlap, but we need to understand libertarian ideas and the way in which Silicon Valley ideology has been fundamentally implicated. I think the one who needs to do something about software, I think we need to understand software. I think we need to be aware of what Palantir stands for and what Facebook does and what X does and all these other things in terms of the, the, the effective consequences and the political consequences of those things. So, you know, I think there's a really interesting agenda there. I don't see any kind of progressive, progressive political party really engaging with these, these, these ideas. And perhaps it's not a kind of party political thing. Maybe it's more of a kind of a cultural politics that we need to engage with. We feel it in the academy through accusations of things like cultural Marxism and the culture wars and so on. That's a manifestation. There's an ideological rationale for, for why that is happening. And it's to do with these, these sorts of ideas. And, and, and I've got an undermining of the legitimacy of, of traditional academic academic ideas, which are seen as as, as blue hills against the inevitable victory of, of an acceleration of capitalism. Thank you, Yang, for the presentation. Just on your point, you made before that <clears throat> um, I've sort of gone down the rabbit hole lately of the Cambridge Analytica yeah. stuff, right? Which I was surprised you didn't uh, mention. Um, uh, and one of the sort of caveats that comes out of that is how woefully equipped sort of our political institutions are to yeah. deal with this yeah. sort of um, uh, attack on our sort of institutions yeah. and things like that. <clears throat> um, also about the Rees Mogg book. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Um, how much of that, there sort of seems to be this uneasy alliance between the old school libertarians yeah. and the fraud and then you know the tech billionaires yeah. they're coming from the irrationary sort of ideas and it's funny how they're uh combining yeah. to drive things like Brexit but with different I guess ideologies yeah. different ideas and things like that. So I guess sort of I don't think have a question but I was hoping just to illuminate a little no, bit it's, 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 it's a great 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 set of comments and, and I think uh, I did talk about the Cambridge Analytics. I think people are familiar with this in terms of the, the, the manipulation of data in terms of both the behavior and the use of social media to, to, to move things. And other than you know, the people that some of these ideas, but what are they trying to do? Uh, it seems to me that, 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 that many of these things are designed to delegitimate administrative states, 
to make us think that democracy isn't working and actually that the private sector and the business models are, are, are much better at getting things done and uh, it can't part part of that. We no longer believe in, you know, we, we hear all the conspiracy theory. This is all part and part of standard conspiracy theory. This, the conspiracy theory is part and part of this, this sort of notion, the undermining, the lack of information, the belief that with manipulation by states or by China or by Russia or, or whatever, it seems to be, be part and parcel of a, a deep, deep, deep legitimation exercise in terms of democratic politics. Uh, and we sort of fall into it because actually there is a crisis of democratic politics as well. And that's something else that we can do in relation to how we can respond to the NRS. We should reinvigorate parliamentary democracy. We should think about um, a, a voting system. We should think about participation. We should think about utilizing the new technologies, for instance, in terms of making speedier uh, decisions. And so all, all, those, all, all of those things. I think the, the relationship between the old libertarian ideas, especially with the top individual, and it wasn't just that book, it was a trilogy. There was a, uh, Blood on the Streets and the Day of Reckoning is a whole series of ideas that, that prefigured um, uh, Blair coming to power and prefigured uh, what they saw as the introduction of, 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 of the internet and of, 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 you know, they called it cyberspace in, in, in those ideas. And it was prefigurative. I mean, it's interesting in terms of the kind of citation structure between those things because, in a sense, when you read um, a sovereign individual, it's near reaction. But, but actually, either land nor Yarvin really cite, cite, cite text. There's a couple of kind of movements there, but they, they arrive at the same conclusion through a, through, 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 through a different period. So I think it's a really interesting set of, set of, um, set of links. And I, I do think these kind of exit strategies are, are, are part and parcel of that kind of, that kind of mindset. Um, so I think it's undermining democracy and a very, some of it's really key PhD if anyone's interested in it. You look at the kind of historical movement of, of um, the recent mob version of, of the sort of libertarianism and, and the Yardin, you know, techno growth uh, model. Well, I think it's going to be a previous question of I think it kind of relates so easy to swing there. Um, what kind of self reflection might be necessary? So um, it always strikes me that universities in the UK, for instance, are keen to set themselves up as the attacked hero of the piece. Yeah. But they're really not great at equality and diversity either. No. So, like, yeah, I suppose the question about how our institutions are tend to be quite racist, sexist, yet we're defending them from these more overtly racist. Sexist. Well, maybe that's we, you know, a, a fundamental reflexive critique on our own practices, you know, without undermining the the the, the what is valuable. I mean, one of the slides here um, uh, is an exercise in that very uh, that very process. I don't know whether it's familiar here, but it was called the Sockel Squared controversy, um, uh, grievance study, where, where a bunch of kind of, you know, some of them were libertarians, some of them weren't, who were very fed up with what was happening in the arts and humanities, managed to get published a whole series of articles about inequality and race and ethnicity within some quite, you know, well-regarded journals, which were essentially not real. One famous one was about dog park rape in uh, Toronto, and one of them was simply a Deleuzean, Foucauldian, Leotardian translation of sections of Mein Kampf that got published to show the 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 the, the kind of the idiocy of contemporary humanity in terms of if you wrote in a particular kind of cultish fashion about things that looked like they were about progressive politics, you would get punished. I think there's a lesson to be learned there. But it, one, it was an unethical thing to do. But it's also, uh, it doesn't mean that there isn't problems within the canon. It doesn't mean that there, there isn't kind of bullying and uh, hierarchies and, and uh, uh, misogyny and racism within, 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 within the academy. So maybe in terms of self-reflection, what, what, what this could allow us to do is to turn in ourselves and rather than fighting each other through sort of intersectional politics or whatever is actually happening at the moment, is that we can think about what is value. How can we communicate? How can we disagree? What analytic uh, strengths do we have? And we might be surprised. We might be surprised. I mean, it might be a real, a real challenge. But the challenge comes out of the academy at the moment. It comes on the internet. It comes from people who have never had a penny, penny post. And there is a, there is, well, let me say, I think there is quite, you know, there is a self-referential uh, 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 character to the contemporary, uh, to the contemporary academy, to the contemporary academy that doesn't always speak to what's actually happening in the world. And has a sort of self-referential 
um, uh, considerations uh, uh, that, that become something uh, in and of itself. So I'm not against the kind of internal critique of what the academy should be, uh, but as long as you know it's not a kind of a, 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 a libertarian crap house, which is what these well, is what these people uh, seem to be suggesting. So yeah, uh, self reflection, a uh, critique, uh, but also a, a, a kind of a, a more uh, politically adept hegemonic resistance on something that we can all believe in and we're proud of. Uh, are we proud of what we do in the, in the humanity and social science? Some people might be, but I think some of it is a is a is a is a, a performative uh, process that, that, that is easy to achieve. So in, in session of that, have lots of men of the Labour who are still around, you know, yeah. doing the summer sessions at the European Graduate yeah. School in yeah. you know Mountainous is it France or you know, I don't know what the word is. Or um, lots of William Gibson. Mm -hmm. Have I responded to their use? In these kind of uh, well, um, ways, or this Gibson, not, Gibson has uh, not directly, but in some of the characterizations in the novels, in terms of the near future ones in, in, in peripheral, which is similar to television, and in um, uh, in one called anyway. So, so think, think about near reaction in the future, and if they're using succession, so the yeah. NRX characters playing NRX characters in, in succession for the film of I think. Um, the land are not really, and I think what's interesting, and, and, and one of the reasons I got interested in the whole area, especially land in, in, the, in, the, in the beginning, relates to the kind of interpretive flexibility that some of our key texts are, are allowed. So it's not just the land who could be interpreted within a century in the fascist framework. I'm sure he doesn't retain the function of the neo fascist, and I'm sure that, yeah, I'm absolutely sure that Deleuze and Atari <laughs> never retained the function in that way. But the degree of interpretive flexibility that those texts allow within these frameworks is a challenge, is a problem. Uh, and, and I think um, uh, um, people's kind of, in, a, in a, the arts and social sciences and humanities, people's kind of commitment to these texts almost in kind of like building sources that seems to be going to is a real problem. Uh, and it, it, the interpretive flexibility of those ideas, I think, is really, is really what interests me. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Tom, for a very interesting. Um, I want to go back to the start and think about the characterization of the alt right more generally and matter yeah. this against the other intellectual directories in the alt right. Yeah. What I think is very fascinating about both Land and Yarvin is that they both reject the label alt right. Yeah. Like uh, Land, especially, has said he doesn't belong to the alt right. And so, what I'm interested in is how this intellectual movement plays with these other things, mm. which I would personally see as more politically dominant. I think yeah. you have this. I guess classic problem in right wing thought where you have a libertarian tradition on the one hand versus this more paleo conservative yeah. tradition on the other. And you have the classic, what I would think of as the core of right, the ones at the top here, the yeah. nationalists, yeah. concerned with the immigration issue, concerned yeah. with racial demographics. Yeah. Anti capitalist to an extent, mm -hmm. anti free market capitalist, more protectionist in nature, versus this NRX, which yeah. is hyper capitalistic in nature. Yeah. Um, how do you view those tensions? Playing against one another. And do you think also that that changes the way we should characterize the tilos of these ideologies? That I would say, for example, the traditional alt right tends itself more towards that fascist designation, mm -hmm. at least that's where it's going. Mm -hmm. This seems to be a more novel kind of authoritarianism, which I probably wouldn't use the word fascism for. I mean, see it as a slightly different kind of techno authoritarian ideology. And I'm just wondering about the tensions between those two. And, how do you might see them going forward in this elite billionaire class? Who are they growing their lot with? I think it's a very, very fair question. I'm not sure of the answer to all, all, all of it. I think, in a sense, um, the novelty of the old right and the way in which it emerged so quickly meant that our working people didn't really know what to do. You know, we came up with these, these grids. And, and I think near reaction probably would have liked something like that initially through, through, through the, early, the, early, uh, the, early, the early blogs. But I, I, I agree that we probably need a a much more subtle set of characterization of those positions. Um, but I don't think that the um, the solution is necessarily just kind of theoretical or analytic. Um, one of my PhD students, James Allen Robertson at the University of Essex, is a complicated social scientist. And he's been doing, when well, he could do this, with an API doing Twitter analyses of the, of the kind of the, the, um, the citations and the retweets between all of these different groups. And he was particularly interested in uh, NRX and looking for what's coming in, what was going out. And you're right, there isn't as much connection with the rest of 
all of this space up here, as you might imagine. It's changed in all the dimensions. It's, it's changed over time. But the point of connection that was strongest was with Catholicism. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. This is, it seems to me like you haven't got a ticket that does not interest. Right. Uh, it seems to me like Yavin in particular does not cultivate that religious sentiment, but now the traditional Catholicism yeah. emerging, particularly in the online yeah. alternative right space, yeah. has become such a dominant intellectual theme. Yeah. And with that, the anti Semitism of traditional Catholicism yeah. as yeah. well, yeah. which Yavin is now trying to build a wall against yeah. that infiltrating the right space. Yeah. And yeah. 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 So again, the, these yeah. tensions kind of bubbling yeah. up, and, and the infighting is very interesting. Very interesting. What will come out of that? I mean, something is. I mean, land is a weird character, but land is now hosting um, stuff about the camp yeah. and about what's in church and about angels at the moment. So, quite kind of what that's all about. He might be back in the church. Um, but but I, I think you're right. So, I, I do think that the application of computational systems of actually quantum connection become, become, become really interesting. And it's a way of thinking about segmenting and actually applying their own tools of data analysis and machine learning on, on the on the quantum connection. Um, but I, I, I think Lang in particular, with his notion of kind of outsiders, sees this as the new avenue. He sees that he, he, he sees progressive left-wing politics as essentially the cathedral and as conservative and as as, as cycling. And and in a sense, although he came at it a different different position, did the last fragments of Mark Fisher's work on acid communism the same much the same thing. You know, he had this huge falling out over the his essay on the Vampire Castle, is that thing over here, you know, in terms of a the kind of the particular exceptional politics and the lack of kind of solidarities and all of those sorts of things, which I think deeply affected him. I'm not saying that he's a reason to be a suicide, but I mean, it was, it was almost like that point of, 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 of the lack of thinking about what a traditional left wing progressive politics um, uh, might, might look like. And the fragments on acid communism was about trying to, to, to not return, but to rehabilitate a more kind of libertarian, progressive, you know, drug happy. A time of progressive politics rather than a kind of an authoritarian rule governing set of set of set of um, uh, government systems that, 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 that we saw. But I think you're right, and I think it requires a kind of a, a radical reanalysis. And some 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 different scientists in, in, in the states in particular are trying to trying to think about uh, these, these things. But also it's moving, and the land is clearly moving, and the seems seem to be moving to the art world. Uh, uh, rather than, um, but it's still an incredibly influential, uh, you know, figure in, in, in the EOP. But leaving that side, the basic premise that democracy is doomed and that the future is about uh, uh, nation states and city states as businesses seems to me to be a very strong motif uh, that, that, that is, is, is easy to understand for people in power with money and people who want to start up their own kind of kingdom, if you can imagine. So I, I think, in a sense, you just take the, but rather than think, I mean, you need to think about the politics in relation to where everything else is going on, but there's an essential kind of premise about what they're trying to do. And I think they are trying to think theoretically, and I would say architecturally, both in terms of uh, 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 technology, but also in terms of the built form, about how you can have societies that function without, without um, a democracy, as they say. It's got the whole series of instances of non-democratic high-tech zones it seems to fare on some measures far better than high tech uh, democratically controlled uh, zones uh, across, across the globe. So, you know, I'm worried. Uh, I, I think the, there's a strong anti democratic impulse amongst the populace, you know, which is, is, is being cultivated and, and, and promulgated by, by these positions. And um, I, I do think the tech is serving a critical function. Um, and, and you can imagine a, a, a future. Certainly within America, uh, where you have a of tax working states with no democratic control run by a business like a person or whatever. So I think that, 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 that that's that's what worries me more, more than the kind of the political philosophy where it came from the best. I think we'll conclude on this last question. This one got a lot of time in mind. <clears throat> She's wondering if there was any thoughts to share your own or um, could be you know, that added in the literature as well. Um, which borrows the technique or mode of decision for imagining an intervention or what governing software development, mm. you know, platforms, etc. Mm. What actually what? Very, very good question. I, I think we can learn something about 
hegemonic strategies and hyperstition and, and, and cultural entities that will themselves into existence in a, in a progressive way. Uh, I'm reading um, uh, Nigel Tripp's recent book on killer cities, and he makes exactly that point. He doesn't use that language, but he's talking about um, you know, the crisis that we face in climatic uh, terms, but also just in terms of biomass loss, in terms of becoming uh, kind of extinct and what we're doing to the sea or whatever. He's trying to identify novels, maps, prototype pictures, different visions of the future that 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 can serve the purpose. And maybe that's an interesting thing that we can do. It doesn't need to be fictional representation. I can think of some that might serve that serve that function. And it's not always science fiction, but something like uh, years, 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 you know that over here in terms of um, written by the guy who did Doctor Who, uh, imagining a kind of post Brexit Britain in terms of what happened in the nineteen twenty. You can imagine that's become a very, very strong motif. Not, not least about putting refugees on 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 kits and, and things. Um, but we need to think about novels, uh, uh, works of art, prototypes uh, that would serve a progressive function that that, 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 that that work in this way against the other kind of constitutional text. And or take those original constitutional texts and give them a, a progressive push. You know, I think Neil Stevenson is a very interesting character. You know, because of course in, in Snow Crack and here's another constitutional notion. Uh, he invented the notion of the metaverse. And in fact, he's now got his own website called the metaverse, which he's trying to kind of run counter to to, 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 to the that version of that. So I don't think there's anything inherently near reactionary about hypersticional politics, but I think it's about a way of thinking about the way in which we work with prototypes and imagine futures in a, in a more critical way than the left is thinking about or what we need to think about the left, you know, progressive future forces, whatever they are. Um, uh, but we have a new actor, and it's called, you know, we've, we've met it through Chat DPT, but we've just released it, and, and in land model, you know, we've been waiting for this, waiting for this to happen. But that is a hypersticional kind of entity per excellence. It is, it is something that has been placed there from the future, uh, uh, and that, that is necessary for the future to be, uh, to be actuated. So, yeah, let's get interested in, let's learn to code. Let's learn about, uh, you know, uh, rethink about what the social sciences are. Let's think about uh, reimagining the politics, you know, but rather than trying to pretend that we still live, live under borders in the dark with our placards outside of our, 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 our university, pretending that we're industrial workers. Maybe there's something else that we can do in terms of a more, uh, you know, a different sort of politics that, 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 is, that is shifted. So, you know, a, a huge, huge agenda, but I think I think we need to think, you know, quite radically um, about how, how, how we can to, um, a politics that is really in these machines. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Ron. We'll clear that. Can we thank Roger Barista for that? Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.